The megaliths, the stones, brought Patrick and I together, and because of them, they had a slight love story connected, and we ended up married. So um, rocks can do a whole bunch of different things in your life if you give them a chance. <laughs> Uh, Patrick had sent to me a very short clip of, of the stone chambers and he said, do you know anything about these? And because he's such an expert in the field, I was surprised, intrigued, and thrilled that I had one up on him. And I said, do I know anything about them? I live in the middle of them. So uh, when he decided to come east, uh, the, the flicker of interest in the, in the stone chambers uh, led and opened us to curiosity. And both of us are people who can't, can't avoid curiosity. It seems to find us. And the curiosity led to fascination. And that led to intrigue. And, and, and then we became enchanted with them. We fell in love with them. And um, I happen to love gemstones. But rocks were not exactly one of the things that drew my attention or fascination. But now they do, because they have a magic to them. And the magic seems to have wound its way around us. Uh, we hadn't intended on doing anything with them until we started to research them in the area, to, to find the chambers, to get into them, to feel their energy, to be um, moved by them, touched by them. And, and we became not only curious and enchanted and fascinated with them, we became passionate about them. Because we realized that, that to this point in time, they're just sort of standing there. And nobody has any idea as to what's going on with them. And, and their antiquity amazed us. And, and if any of you have had the opportunity or do have the opportunity to actually stand in any of them, you'll know what I'm talking about when I say magic. There is an energy there that takes you out of time and puts you in a place of peace, tranquility, and protection that is profoundly amazing. Now, all of this sort of, we, we played with our photographs, we played with researching, we played with talking to people. And Patrick had the idea to put a video together to see just what we could do with this type of energy. And so we did put the video up on YouTube. And I think to, the, to date, there have been over 15,000, almost 20,000 hits on it. And it led us to talk to a, a producer, a, uh, promoter, actually, uh, Gibby Media in, in Salt Lake City. And Patrick had been commissioned to do 13 uh, documentaries with him. And instead of doing one of the documentaries that had been planned, Secrets of the Stone had been put in its place. So what you're going to see today is a rough cop, a very rough copy. Please be gentle. We, <laughs> there, are, there are hiccups. And, and there are skips, and there are probably other things that we have to, to fix in them. But this is the, the sort of the baby, the seed to what will become uh, a documentary in a 13-part 13, 13 series. It's called, it's called Destiny of Man. And if you want to check out the website, it's destinyofman.tv. And it's for um, the, the cable channels, History, Discovery, and, and probably National Geographic. So um, that, we, that we rolled into this was magical. That I can't say we worked hard on it because we have celebrated every moment. Um, I can't tell you the number of ticks I have pulled off both him and the dog. Um, I've, I see everybody go crashing into the woods, following stone walls that go nowhere, but, but thoroughly enjoying it. Um, our dog has become a caveite. And, and the chamberite, she can't stay out of them either. So um, if a car stops along, if we stop along the side of the road, you can be sure there's a wall or a chamber someplace. And I don't think in the last year and a half we have arrived on time anywhere. Because there's always, there's a wall, there's a structure. Oh my god. And, and it, you'll get involved in it too. You'll find that things that you didn't notice before, you are suddenly noticing. And these are, to me, silent sentinels of times long past. And there's magic here. And I don't know what the magic is, but I do know that it has certainly um, aroused a new, a new interest and a new energy within my life. And it enhances everything that I see and touch. And it's something that I am passionate about. Patrick is as well. It has changed our lives. And hopefully, 
it will change yours and everyone who sees this as well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this off, turn this on, and let you see our baby. And again, it's just a rough copy, but it, it, is, it does tell the story. OK, this off. You can tell I'm not a computer person. OK, Jason, what am I not hitting? Got it? OK. Weaving across the face of New England and creating a literal web of mystery are hundreds of thousands of miles of stone walls including numerous other unexplained stone structures and thousands of stone chambers. The chambers appear randomly, sometimes capping the ends of great stone walls or appearing to be built into the sides of hills. These megaliths stand silently, a testimony and a reminder of the antiquity of the area, but with no reminders as to their purpose or that of those who created them. The walls honeycomb the land, seeming to guide the paths of the roads they border, or at other times appearing to be randomly directed. They often define what seem to be specific areas, or appear to wander aimlessly through the remote forests. The most recent residents of these areas accept them as always having been there, and credit ancestors, indigenous peoples, early explorers, ancient cultures, or even glaciers as the creators. They are accepted as a part of the landscape, and as such, their mystery becomes folklore, and the facts of their creation are hidden in plain sight. They are silent, ancient tracings of times long past, a testimony of a fragment of our history not yet recorded or acknowledged. Yet similar structures appear all over the world and have been chronicled and recorded for centuries in books and in literature. One needs only to stand in the presence of one of the stone chambers to pause for a moment within one of them, to feel the antiquity and know that unusual means and methods were used in their creation. What has most recently come to light is the incredible number of these stone structures that are scattered across the landscape and are slowly being sacrificed to the expansion of a new generation which is not mindful or focused upon preserving their own history. Countless numbers of the chambers, miles of stone walls, and other structures have been carelessly dismantled or altered with no regard to the antiquity they represent. The stone walls represent yet another aspect of the mysteries of the stones. In 1939, using data from an 1872 Department of Agriculture report on fences, it was estimated that there was a combined length of approximately a quarter of a million miles of stone walls in the New England area, a length equivalent to a single wall stretching around the earth over 10 times. The mass of stone used in the walls is greater than that from all the ancient stone monuments in the world combined. Utilizing modern technology, these numbers would clearly be increased exponentially. Because of the vast numbers and extreme lengths of the stone walls, most New Englanders are aware of their presence. They are obviously difficult to miss. Few, however, have any idea as to their purpose or for that matter, who actually created them. They have been described as boundary markers, stock fences, and property demarcations. What escapes reason and understanding is that they are often random, close together, and without direction. Starting and stopping for no apparent reason, going up hills and across ridges, in areas that could not have been planted or used for grazing or agriculture. Often closely connected to these walls are other unusual structures, most notably thousands of stone chambers scattered across the landscape. Despite being described as colonial root cellars, ice houses, and animal birds, 
birthing chambers, there is ample evidence that these chambers existed long before the European settlers arrived. Various design elements preclude any possibility that they were used as living structures, and aspects of astronomical or seasonal alignments have often been noted, and almost casual apathy seems to surround them. Beside the stone walls and chambers, there are several other stone anomalies, including subterranean structures, stone circles, standing rows of stones, balanced rocks, stone piles, commonly known as cairns, and several other strange structures, possibly even including dry stone constructed bridges. A time clock is ticking. We need to preserve these fragments of history before they are erased forever by new technology and creeping industry, rendering us void of a past and removing the history of the very foundations of our country. Antiquity has attempted to teach us that the true quest of discovery lies not in seeking to create new horizons, but rather in removing the veils of theory masquerading as fact that cloud our vision and clearing our sight to encompass the totality of our environment. Although New England has the greatest preponderance of stone edifices in the world, scattered across the globe, there are examples of similar structures. Other countries far exceed the United States in their attempt to preserve history. It is important to restate here that the stone structures of New England comprise the largest collection of stone structures in the world. Here we present but a few of these amazing structures found in the New England states and surrounding areas. The countryside of Connecticut is crisscrossed with stone walls, randomly meandering along the roads, intersecting fields, tracing unusual patterns along stony ledges and through dense forested areas. Stone chambers appear alongside busy roads and perch on deserted rocky hillsides. One of the most publicized areas is that of Gunji Womp in the town of Groton. Gathered on this site of over a hundred acres are examples of stone chambers, stone circles, standing stones, and colonial foundations, representing habitation for thousands of years. An illustration of how the environment can reclaim and erase the presence of humanity. Massachusetts as well has an amazing collection of stone structures. From the unusual collection of balancing stones in Lynn to the standing rocks of Lowell, these majestic stones stand as silent sentries of times long past. Still at their posts, marking their place in time. New York State's historic Hudson Valley Basin holds the largest documented number of stone chambers and walls to date. Dozens of chambers are right along busy highways, while others are sheltered in the abundant forests that are a part of local land trusts or state and national park systems. These areas have attracted interest in the past decades because of the unusual number of chambers that have been found in such a concentrated area. There have been books and pamphlets focused on the chambers and walls, and a very few dedicated individuals have tried to draw attention to these unusual structures from out of time. New Hampshire's town of Salem has been acclaimed as being the site of the old man-made construction in the United States. Called American Stonehenge, this site comprises roughly 30 acres and is a collection of chambers, walls, standing stones, and other stone structures. It is speculated that it was built by an ancient culture, which was determined from the carbon dating of charcoal pits, dating them back to 2000 BC. As of 2010, the states of Vermont, Rhode Island, Maine, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey all have an impressive collection of stone structures, still standing and intact, 
walls wind their way throughout these areas as well, connecting and reminding us all of a time and perhaps even a culture and people the history books have neglected to mention. New England and its surrounding neighbors still are the curators of the largest collections of stone structures in the world. From the early 1600s, there is documented speculation as to who had constructed the walls and chambers and why, clearly indicating that the early settlers to this country were not their creators. Many of these walls are four feet high with a six foot foundation. Some walls are 12 feet high and 20 feet wide. What kind of animal commonly used in agricultural regions would require a wall of that size? The effort to build the hundreds of thousands of miles of stone walls, chambers, and structures would have been the most costly and labor-intensive undertaking in colonial history. Yet there is not even the slightest mention of this massive construction project in the historical records. The Native Americans in residence during that time were not fence builders. They respected the land and did not partition it for any reason, most especially to mark personal possession. And so the question still remains and drifts upon the ether. Who did build them and why? most interesting point to ponder. When one looks at the sheer length of the walls, 240,000 miles that were estimated in 1939 using the data from the Department of Agriculture's report on fences from 1872, it is quite clear that this was an engineering feat of gargantuan proportions. Using simple calculations and allowing for one day's rest out of every week, with a mandatory three months break when the northeast winters made it impossible for any outdoor work. It would appear that if the early colonists constructed these walls between 1620 and 1872, they would have had to average four miles a day, one third of a mile every hour, or one foot every two seconds. And they had to average this consistently each and every year for 250 years, regardless of the devastating revolutionary, civil, and Indian wars. Clearly, this was not the case, for there are no significant records of any major expanses of walls or other megalithic structures, since it would have constituted the largest construction project in world history, it would have been an effort worth recording in some small way. There are most probably almost as many theories about who or what actually assembled the great collection of stone structures in Northeast America as there are people who are aware of their existence. The most popular theory is that the early colonists and the indigenous occupants constructed this huge network of stone structures, walls, chambers, and other stone anomalies that represent the largest collection on the entire planet. It is very clear that this was a physical impossibility, and so we need to examine the other theories that have been postulated over time. The obvious antiquity of some of these structures and complexes leads to the theory that they were suspected to be built by ancient cultures who explored North America long before the Europeans arrived. This provides at least a slightly realistic alternative to the colonists and the native residents of the time. It is believed that a number of different cultures may have visited the area, including the Irish, the Druids, the Vikings, the Phoenicians, and even a mysterious ancient woodland people. However, any evidence that an ancient culture spent centuries of time millions of man-hours, or establish the support communities required to carry out such a Herculean effort is sadly lacking. There well may be artifacts showing foreign origins buried beneath the accumulation of centuries of time, but neither modern techniques and technology or current science have been able to give us a definitive answer to this date. Perhaps they were not looking in the appropriate places. One of the stranger theories is that the placement of many of these massive stones was the result of what is commonly called glacial erratica, 
a result of the theoretical ice age. To examine this theory of stone structure origin, we must first consider the source. The ice age is, unfortunately for those using it in this case, a theory. A theory in its simplest form is an unproved assumption. This particular unproven assumption has been floating around since the middle of the 19th century and has been used to try to explain a number of geographic anomalies, a catch-all theory as it were, which has found favor in scientific circles for its ability to absorb many tough problems which science is simply unable to explain or seems to be unwilling to explore the new horizons these anomalies present. Science would have us believe that these wondrous, seemingly intelligent glaciers were the architects that created hundreds of delicately balanced boulders weighing many tons, stone circles, countless dolmens, and standing stones. Clearly a designer glacier that exhibited <laughs> theoretical intelligent design, not just once, but thousands of times. If the Ice Age weren't a somewhat illogical theory, already discredited by anthropological evidence, it should be dismissed as simply ridiculous in relationship to any role in creating these stone anomalies. The stone walls that weave their way across the landscape elicit theories of their creation as well. Even in very primitive cultures, walls have had a very specific purpose, to enclose a defined area. In the case of what can only be described as structures or building remains, we find that to be true. But when dealing with a fence variety of stone walls, we find it is almost never the case. They simply do not enclose anything. The walls that remain standing today generally run in unbroken lines with open ends. They start and then just stop. These walls do not commonly connect to each other to make an enclosure, which discounts the theory that they were used for agricultural purposes. Often other walls will intersect but terminate abruptly, leaving us with small pieces of an overwhelmingly huge puzzle or labyrinth. These remains of times long past create a puzzle of their own. There are many different patterns of walls and none of them fall into the current logical definition attributed to what is a wall's logical and simple application. One of the most common theories used to explain away the presence of these walls was that they define property boundaries. As with the agricultural theory, they seldom enclose anything, which negates any concept that they are megalithic boundary fences. Many claim they were built to last and indeed, they have done that. They have lasted longer than any record found that established such borders, despite the fact that the colonial inhabitants were quite literate and kept excellent records of such things. They have, in essence, lasted longer than the explanation as to what they were for and who made them. In viewing wills from the 17th and 18th centuries, we found no mention of walls being used as delineating property lines. Most deeds of the time used landmarks or topographical features to mark boundaries, never using or mentioning the vast abundance of stone walls that littered the landscape. The dwellings of the settlers were constructed of wood, and yet they created massive stone walls to mark their property. It would appear that they were more focused on the longevity of their fences than they were about their homes. Wood was an abundant resource. It is easier and more efficient to use for fence building, and yet there are those who would have us believe that they chose to construct walls from the stones that cluttered the fields. Lack of the use of wood only adds to the mystery surrounding the stone walls. There were many strange occupations in colonial America, including measures of wood, viewers of bricks, and of course, fence viewers. After studying many cases, nothing could be found about inspections of what should have been their main concern, stone walls. Considering you could almost not look in a 300 
60 degree arc without seeing one or more stone walls standing anywhere in New England. This is a grave oversight to say the least. It is almost as if these massive structures were seen as part of the landscape rather than having any specific purpose needing official attention. There are parallel walls, zigzag walls, and road walls to add to the mystery of these ancient structures. The parallel walls often run very closely to one another, sometimes over long distances. Theorists propose that the open areas between the walls were used to grow crops between stock pens or even other walled fields, a most unusual agricultural practice, and almost none of these walls are a part of any walled enclosure, either as stock corrals or farms. There is no access for animals or plows to work these thin fields, except to approach them from thousands of yards at either end. No openings are provided along these walls, making the purpose elusive to reason. There are those who postulate that they are simply above-ground linear landfills, used to rid the land of the majority of its prime content, rocks. Why then do we still find an overabundance of rocks in the land around these supposed rock depositories? Did they just give up trying to rid the land of rocks by building stone walls thousands of times? There are those who even claim the reason we find more stones is that the rocks literally floated to the surface of the soil after an upper layer of stones has been removed in just one growing season, <coughs> suggesting perhaps that the land was more conducive for the production of stones than a food crop. <laughs> Lack of logic and reality are no stumbling blocks when it comes to these theories. Frequently, there are stone walls that border roads for countless miles, broken only by modern technology as it has erased sections and interfered with the symmetry that once was there. Individual homes have intersected the walls just to provide access while the walls just flow forward. The roads are meandering with few straight stretches, often appearing to be cut in trenches between the walls. And for the logic and reality challenged crowd, there is another irrational theory, that for some yet unexplained reason, the road builders built the walls as a nice border for the roads. One has to wonder why more effort was put into the building of the walls than the construction of the road itself, and further, did the walls follow the roads, or perhaps the more logical question, did the roads follow the walls, which seem to be far more ancient in origin? One of the most unusual configurations used in the construction of the hundreds of thousands of miles of stone walls is the evidence of the zigzag patterns that often occur. It would seem <coughs> difficult enough to build these fences out of very big rocks, an obvious great waste of time when wood was abundantly available. But why waste valuable time, human energy, and greatly extend the workload by using a completely inefficient and illogical zigzag pattern? Obviously, it would have to be only those with a lot of time, incredible strength, and misplaced priorities on their hands. Something not available in a land <coughs> often called stone soup with a harsh winter environment. When assessing the validity of these thousands of miles of stone walls as just having agricultural purposes, we must consider Putnam County in New York State. This area contains the largest, longest, and greatest number of stone walls, and the highest number of stone chambers anywhere in the world. Yet it was the last region to be inhabited because it was the least desirable area for agriculture in the entirety of the northeastern United States. In this area, the stone structures are the least likely to have any agricultural purpose, and yet, we find the greatest concentration of the chambers here. It has been postulated that the reason there are so many of these stone chambers in the Putnam Valley region is because the terrain is so very inhospitable. 
Perhaps the reason we find so many in this area is because it was the last to be developed, and industry and progress have not yet had the chance to encroach upon them, to erase these silent testimonies to a time and a past that has been lost from awareness and memory. Perhaps last to be developed means last to be destroyed. Of all the stone structures found in the New England area, perhaps the most unique and intriguing are the stone chambers. They are found all over the world and in many of the United States, but New England has the greatest preponderance than anywhere else in the world. The indigenous residents deny being their creators. Early mercenaries hired to eradicate the original residents of New England wrote about the Indian stone castles they kept stumbling across, indicating that they were already present and a mystery in the early stages of conquering and taming the wilderness that was to become the United States. In 1654, letters were written to the governor of the English colony of Connecticut, John Winthrop, asking about these structures and their extensive existence and questions about their builders. But sadly, we do not have the luxury of his reply. These amazing chambers vary in size and shape, usually averaging about 15 feet deep by 10 feet wide with a height of 5 to 8 feet, and are usually constructed of granite. Granite is a dense, hard to cut, and heavy to lift rock, which rates on the Moss scale of hardness for rock at an 8. About the only way to cut it, even by modern standards, is with diamond-embedded blades. The chambers are characteristically constructed of tightly fitted, dry stones, meaning that no mortar of any kind has been used, and capped with numerous megalithic slabs. Some of these chambers are actually accessed through passageways cut into the hillsides, and heavy lentils, technically known as orthostats, crown the doorways. The type of structural construction used in these chambers is called corbelled. This form of design is not only extremely difficult to master, it is very rare globally and usually is found only in ancient edifices. It is not practical or logical to consider that many colonists were skilled in such a rare form of building and used those skills to raise <coughs> megalithic structures using stone components whose weight was measured not in pounds, but in tons. The most commonly stated use for these chambers is that the colonists built them to use as root cellars, to be used as food storage for winters. This philosophy seems to be a concept used only from lack of the ability to come up with any other rational reason, even though it does not fit the design requirements to serve that purpose. An absolute requirement for a root cellar is that there be appropriate ventilation cross ventilation being necessary for the preservation of food. Less than 10% of the chambers have any cross ventilation, and the remaining 90% would rot food in a matter of weeks. It should also be taken into consideration that they were not of a size that would be able to store food enough to maintain a family of any size for an entire winter. A small matter of a missing door also implies that the chambers were not designed to be a place of safe harbor for food. There are also no indications that there were ever any shelves upon which to store food. The walls show no signs of ever having supported any sort of wooden structures for that purpose. It is also very rare that any dwelling foundations can be found near these chambers, so there is no evidence that they were used in everyday life in colonial times. The colonists most likely put them to use for a multitude of purposes, but that was only because they were already here not root cellars, because those were normally very close, if not under the dwellings that they served. There have been some that suggested that they were at one time used for dwellings of some sort. One would only have to spend one winter in New England to realize that this could not possibly have been their purpose. Once more, ventilation would have been a problem, but for a very different reason. The only way to heat these chambers would be by fire and there is nowhere for the smoke to go. There would have had to be an opening in the ceiling, and that would not have been possible with the kind of construction that was used. The smoke would have left its mark, even over the centuries, and there is no evidence that smoke ever encrusted their walls. 
There were also no openings for light as well, other than the doorway, which had no door, a requirement for a region that has very chilly winters. The use of these chambers as megalithic ice houses seems as impractical as using them to store food. Not so much because of the ventilation, but rather the tiny amount of space obtained through such a labor and material intensive project. Doors would obviously be required. Perhaps they just rolled big stones across the opening when they were done. And the need to be near a body of water is another stumbling block to the ice house theory. While some of the chambers do appear to be near water, most are not. Some are on mountains and very inaccessible. Animal birthing chambers, Indian sweat lodges, vision quest chambers, and simple storage buildings are just a few of the other uses for these incredible structures. Though some archaeological work has been done to determine the purpose and age of these chambers, there has been an absence of artifacts that would support a definite purpose. Fringe theories abound about their construction and purpose. Some reach into the outer regions, such as quantum physics, and portals to other dimensions. But these are just theories. Again, unproven assumptions. Many believe the stone chambers will always remain a mystery, lost in time. But time just might reveal some answers to those who are really listening. It would seem that their message is being ignored, because they still maintain their silence and their mystery. They could possibly give us answers to so many unanswered questions we have about the evolution of our culture. But instead of preserving them, we move into new areas of exploration, quite possibly missing the doorway to the future, because it is so simple and subtle it has gone without notice for hundreds, perhaps thousands of years. It is indeed unfortunate to consider that a vast majority of these New England stone chambers have been torn down for their stones to make way for parking lots repeatedly vandalized or otherwise dismantled, destroyed, or for want of a better word, desecrated by those who are focused upon progress while they sacrifice <coughs> monuments of time through ignorance, greed, and apathy. There are untold thousands of anomalous and megalithic stone structures in every corner of the globe. And according to some researchers, there is photographic evidence that there are even unexplained structures on the planet Mars, as well as our own satellite, the Moon. They are found in almost every part of the planet and consistently defy the primitive construction skills of the ancient cultures that lived where they are located. The timeless structures of North America lack the grandeur of the Great Pyramids of Egypt, the beauty of Machu Picchu, the engineering wonders of Pumapunka, or the infrastructure of Teotihuacan. But they do share many common aspects with them and other archaic structures worldwide and their origins are no less mysterious. They certainly share a common thread with the multiple thousands of amazing ancient structures. They are a riddle, wrapped in a mystery, inside of an enigma. Anthropologists and archeologists have very conveniently taken all the great mysteries of the world, including the structures of North America, and pigeonholed them into two commonly used categories, ignoring the diversities and uniqueness of these structures worldwide, lumping them together so they could easily be ignored. They are either of religious origin, used for worship, human sacrifices to the gods, or bizarre blood rituals of some type, or they have astronomical alignments and were used for rituals involving the seasons, planting, or simply used for star worship. This stereotyping of every ancient structure and artifact proves the short-sightedness of the scientific community. If it doesn't fit into a specific and completely inflexible set of predetermined and approved criteria, it is not considered, and quite simply, it does not exist. Ignoring many unanswered questions indicates a sad inability to adapt to our ever-expanding reality. And so reality, becomes the enemy and is covered up at every opportunity. 
Instead of expanding understanding and knowledge as awareness and insight stretch into new levels and dimensions of discovery, science becomes the greatest barrier to any true understanding of our past, and for that matter, the potential that is open to humanity. No matter how many times the contrary is expressed, we know virtually nothing about the builders of most of the ancient structures of North America. And, despite pompous claims of primitive cultural origins, we know nothing about the builders of the great ancient structures worldwide. We cannot explain how the massive blocks were lifted up hundreds of feet to the tops of pyramids. And we have the same problem with the massive ceiling and structural stones that are found in the stone chambers. How did ordinary men lift stones even bigger than the blocks we find in the pyramids? Neither the colonists nor the native inhabitants or the primitive Egyptians had any equipment capable of lifting such great weights. Interestingly, even the composition of the components of both the King's Chamber in New York and the King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid are the same. Very hard granite. At America's Stonehenge in North Salem, New Hampshire, an even more important similarity exists. The Great Pyramid in Egypt is the largest single collection of monoliths in the world and, not surprisingly, the largest megalithic structure ever built. It is one of the few wonders of the world still standing. The largest stone in the largest megalith in the world is a 70-ton monster of red granite, rivaling the weight of a modern locomotive. That puts this stone firmly in the category of what can only be called a super monolith. An anchor stone in the Oracle Chamber at America's Stonehenge weighs in at an even greater weight of 75 tons. However, to further demonstrate how great the American stone structures are, in Lanesboro, Massachusetts, there is a balanced rock weighing more than the Oracle Chamber anchor stone and the Great Pyramid's King's Chamber granite monolith combined. It weighs 165 tons, and it is balanced perfectly in a way that defies explanation. <coughs> Yet another telling similarity between the ancient structures of North America and the rest of the world is clear evidence that many of the stones were quarried. There are what appear to be saw marks, right angles, and drill marks that are clearly seen on many of the monoliths and chambers and structures in North America, as well as those worldwide. This could be seen as evidence of fairly modern work, but only if one ignores that many of these stone monoliths and masonry work are granite. On the scale of material hardness, granite is one of the hardest and most, most difficult to cut, polish, drill, or chisel, and almost always is used in decorative rather than structural purposes. Drill marks and holes in and on the stones of America, Egypt, and Mesoamerica were made by hardened steel alloy bits or technology lost to time, not bone or copper tools as science would have us believe. No single stone anomaly is more intriguing or mysterious than a perfectly balanced boulder weighing over a hundred tons. Amazingly, many of these have remained fixed in their seemingly precarious positions for centuries. Some have even been known to rock until they very simply settled into a static state, while others have been reported to sing when struck. One can imagine playful giants challenging one another to see who can balance the biggest boulder. Although the glaciers are said to be the balance masters, logic dissipates that theory as laughable. No, these wonders of anti-gravity did not just magically appear. They were definitely very deliberately placed, but no logical reason other than just the pleasure of balancing something very big or nature art comes to mind. Who is big enough or powerful enough to accomplish such a Herculean and seemingly impossible task? Only one of two conclusions can be drawn in the case of how these stones were cut, polished, grooved, drilled, chiseled, and moved. We could consider that they were created by ancient, highly advanced cultures from other worlds or dimensions with technology, skills, equipment, and tools 
survival and actually exceed our own modern technology, and then left the planet leaving their handiwork behind. Or that they were ancient human cultures with amazing technology, equipment, and tools that were destroyed so effectively or buried so deep that not even a single hint remains. And the only evidence of their presence are the monuments they left behind, scattered across the face of the globe, standing as a testimony to the greatness that once was and could yet be again. Any force so powerful to destroy any evidence of human creation would also destroy the edifices as well. Not a single word or a tiny scrap of evidence as to how humans created incredible structures our own modern and highly advanced technology could not accomplish. Are we to believe that civilization once reached an advanced technological state greater than our own, returned to a primitive existence, then went back to an advanced technological state, leaving no evidence of that evolutionary roller coaster ride behind? Mankind, humanity, is on a journey through time. As a species, we have traveled through time periods marked by ignorance and darkness, enlightenment and reason. We have marked time as to development, religion, industry, and empires. Thousands of years of evolving our knowledge and wisdom, naming each phase of expansion with yet another apparent conquest of the unknown. This current time has been called a new age, one theoretically marked by exploration and illumination, a time of progress and development. Merriam-Webster defines progress as the gradual betterment, especially the progressive development of humankind. Is the destruction of antiquity and history the kind of foundation upon which we want to build? By destroying the legacy of our past, we have nothing to build upon. These walls and chambers are more than just piles of rocks. Though found all over the world, these stones speak a common language, and they tell a story of our footprints in time. They hold information and insight of where we came from and help to provide a foundation for us to build upon for future generations. We are but a small voice, a whisper if you will, Join your voices to ours to create a roar of protest against the destruction and apathy towards the largest collection of stone structures in the world. Voice by voice, we can create a crescendo of outrage, a collective voice that cannot be ignored or silenced. Together, we can halt the erasure of the tracings of our past from the landscape, and perhaps, in time, truly learn the secrets that they hold for us. Patrick and Barbara come up here, and we're going to do a uh, quick um, question and answer session. If there are any questions. <laughs> any questions? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Hi. Yes. Uh, have the, the stone walls been outlined like the Nazca lines at all, like maps? No, there's nothing available for that. We're trying to get, there's an interesting, I believe one of the speakers uh, mentioned it, it's called LIDAR. And I know the University of Connecticut has uh, some line drawings that they've taken in the past, and we're going to try to get a hold of those. We had somebody with the University of Connecticut that was going to provide us with that, but we're going to have to go in through another route to get that. But what I'd like to see, I mean, what I'd really like to see is all the trees knocked down <laughs> so, so that we could actually get. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, I mean, you know what, you understand what I'm saying. But that would be the only way that we'd actually get a, a, a clear view of what this is. And the, the strange thing that we've noticed, and we have done, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours of tr tromping through the woods looking at these things. And hundreds. Yeah, and they do not <clears throat> seem to enclose anything. I'm almost wondering if we just lift up and you know take an aerial view without all the, the obstructions in the view that we'd see something very strange. So 
but that would be nice to do. We needed to, to do it area by area. Now, until people start taking these things seriously as an actual historical treasure, and what we really want to do is start getting these things on, on national registries or something. We're working, you know, we haven't had much time to deal with it, but we're working on that. Yes? Um, do you know about the Archaeological Conservancy? It's no, I'm not familiar. It's based on the same way as the Nature Conservancy, since we, it's not patrimony of the state. They either buy the land or they talk to the owners and have them put something in the deed to protect the sites in America, and they mm -hmm. just work Oh, we'll definitely look into that, yeah. Well, see, we're not archaeologists. Uh, we're basically, I'm a, uh, I wear a lot of hats. Uh, uh, I am a, a producer with Gibby Media, and it's not Salt Lake. It's Spokane, Washington, where we're located. Out west. Yeah, it's out west. And uh, so, okay. so our effort right now is to, to get this to the National, we want National Geographic to buy it. That's what we're looking for. History Channel, National Geographic, Discovery, or even the Travel Channel, amazingly. Uh, are looking at things like this. So basically what we want to do is bring attention to it. Then we can start dealing, and on the website, there's uh, their business card to the back, secretsofthestones.org is the, is the website that this is all based on. And on that website, there is a link where you can go, I believe it's votesmart.org, uh, where you can go and contact, it'll give you all the information on all your representatives, and pretty soon we'll have a sample uh, letter up there so that we can possibly start beginning to get this under a national registry, but we've heard some things here that have been very important in that, in that line that people are actually doing, so that's very important. Any other questions? Okay. Well, this, we just, uh, we just put this documentary, to, it's not even a documentary, this is like a, a, a storyboard for us. This goes from here to my production company. And it would have cost me $30,000 to get this thing done professionally. So I did it myself. But it's, uh, and that's why it's so rough. But we, we send it to our uh, studio. If they think the History Channel is going to buy it, they're going to produce it, and then we'll start promoting it elsewhere. But what will happen is it will probably be in commercial production within the next year or so. But it takes a long time to get these things done. Okay, well, thank you very wait, much. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait, sorry. Wait. Um, <laughs> also, there, there is, we have a, a very rough copy okay. of our copy, and we'd be happy to share it with anybody that would like a copy of the copy. Mm -hmm. Of the copy. But, but this will be available through the, uh, uh, you guys, are, they're recording it, so it will be available at the front desk. Mm -hmm. Yes. Bathroom scale. <laughs> we don't. We don't. Now, I'm actually a, a, a general contractor, uh, and I have had experience in this field. I've actually been a construction technology instructor. I can give you rough estimates, but we take them from what other people say they weigh. That's that's basically it. And I don't uh, I don't uh, you know pretend to know what I'm talking about. The Lanesboro one. If any of you have seen that, oh, that was that was um, that was estimated to weigh about the same thing as a locomotive. No, no, it's <clears throat> much more. More than a locomotive. Yeah. <laughs> twice, twice, twice the size of a locomotive. And, and Patrick was very reverent about it. I tried to push it over. <laughs> it will move. I actually even had a metal detector, and I tried to see if there was any iron in it, like a steel rod holding it in, and, and there wasn't as far as I could tell. So um, extreme super glue, for sure. Yes? Is it a giant sleeping? No. Um, it's probably 8 to 10 feet long, maybe uh, 5 to 6 feet wide, and about 5 so feet high. Stick out. Absolute, his feet would stick out, or his head would <laughs> stick out for sure. Um, it doesn't, it, 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 the amazing thing about it, while, I, while standing in one, you can't figure out what it could possibly have been used for. Uh, it is undeniable that there is an energy and a feeling in them. There is, there is an aspect of them. It's, it's not the kind that electrifies you. It's, it's a peaceful, tranquil, tranquil protective feeling. And, and um, I'm a medium, and, and it's certainly I was looking for, are there any spirits or ghosts here or anything like that? And I found it absolutely clean. I found every chamber we ever went into um, I didn't go into the ones with garbage in them, 
but um, the ones that we were able to go in and, and stay, they felt clean, they felt clear, they felt amazingly, I, I would spend the night in them if they had a bathroom in heat. <laughs> I don't rough it. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, they quite possibly, you know, I don't really know what they were used let me, for. Let me address that. It's interesting that a lot of the energy that they're talking about deals with fertility. Um, but uh, it's really hard to say. I'm almost, uh, you know, we don't have, we have no agenda whatsoever about what, you know, we, we're not promoting any agenda about who created these. We do know, like Hugh pointed out, that there are a lot of civilizations that when we went in as the Europeans and the uh, went in and started conquering these ancient civilizations, they told us that the gods built these things. And that's my specialty. I'm an exotheologist. I study the, the extraterrestrials throughout history, and especially in religions. And uh, they're everywhere. The flying gods are everywhere. Almost all the major gods are flying gods. And they all, the Aztecs, the Mayans, and the Incas, when they went in, and the Navajos, and the, and the, Hopi. the, the Hopi, and all these people, when they went in and they talked to them, and they said, who built these things? They said the gods did it. And they ignored them because, obviously, there's only one god, for starters. And secondly, you know, uh, this is not anthropologically correct. So what, uh, so what you know, we're, we're tending toward that, but we don't promote that idea. We, the most important thing is we need to preserve them so that we can find out exactly who did it and why. We may never find out, but let's not destroy them before we even have a chance to look. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the sites that we have investigated, that, that have been investigated, have found no artifacts. Yeah. None. Okay. So they're clean and clear, as, as far as we can tell. Yes? The, uh, there's a, well, there's a stone chamber in Goshen that we had a picture of, but there's a, a mystery tunnel also, which is a shaft that goes down 15 feet, <coughs> and then 75 foot on one side and 32 foot on the other. I think it was James Whitehall and Malcolm Pearson did excavations in the 80s. And they found a stun, uh, sun stone disks and uh, other artifacts that they were disks found at Calendar One. Mm -hmm. and those sun stone disks and other artifacts at the uh, Ocean Historical Museum. Yeah. So there's been artifacts found at some, some of the sites in yeah. well, at five different uh, quarry sites. Those I mean, uh, yeah. sun stone disks have been found. Well, there's no question in my mind that ancient civilizations visited this, this continent long before Columbus ever even imagined that he could. Uh, and, of course, we know the Vikings. We can see that there, there's evidence up in Newfoundland that the Vikings were here. Uh, and there were probably evidence of many cultures. Supposedly, there was an Egyptian tomb found in the middle of the Grand Canyon. You've got all kinds of things that are strange. But, of course, the Smithsonian and the the government will cover that up as much as possible because they want everything to be sort of Eurocentric and keep it down to the creationist concept that 4004 BC was the first time man ever walked on this earth. And they have to keep it down to, you know, as, as much as they can. But w basically what we, what we see is that there is definitely evidence of, of, uh, of ancient cultures being here. We're not saying that they didn't come here. We're just, say, we're just saying that there's no evidence of the culture actually being here to such an extent that they could create something as extensive as these walls and chambers.